Let's go to Second Peter chapter one. And we're gonna read the first the first eleven verses therein. Second Peter chapter one. And it reads like this. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of, the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us. I'm going to make a correction because in the New King James translation, that word is by, and it is accurate, but it's not the most accurate. When you study that word in the Greek, it can be by or into. And when I look at this verse in its context, a more accurate translation is not by. The most accurate is not by, it is actually into. So if we read it in that context, it reads like this. As his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us into glory and virtue. Yes, by glory and virtue, God is glorious and virtuous, but, but this is what he is called. You're called into. Are, are we together? Study it in the Greek. Who's called us into glory and virtue. By which having been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. What a promise. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love for if these things are yours and abound you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the contrary for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins therefore brethren be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for if you do these things you will never stumble for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want us to have a conversation this morning around this idea, this theme, the storm-proof life. The storm proof life. Uh, 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 not to be mistaken with the storm repellent life. I didn't say that. I, I didn't say the storm deflecting life. I, I didn't say the, the storm eliminating life. I, I didn't say I, I can't I, I can't do that. God never promised that. I said the storm proof life. Father, thank you for this moment that we have here together with you. God, we honor your word. We value it, God. In, in the beginning was the word, and, and the word was with you, and the word was you, and, 
and everything that was made was made by your word at the entrance of your word there is light we don't live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth your word is a lamp into our feet it is a light into our path we love your word more than our necessary food and so we take this moment very very seriously this is life or death hallelujah and so, God, I thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and insight and knowledge. I thank you for an open heaven, God. Hallelujah. Over me in this moment, God. So much so that it will cause the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight, God. May your word go forth and may it not return void. May it take root in hearts and minds. May it bring, bring change and transformation, God. May mindsets shift. May bodies heal. May yokes break may purpose be illuminated God may truth crystallize Holy Ghost have your way in Jesus name amen 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 God bless you you may you may be seated you may be seated you may be seated this text obviously was written by Peter and and I, I am I'm a student of leaders and leadership. I, I, like to, I like to read. I'm the guy that likes to read about the kings and the Bible. I like to read the king's story. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, one of the reasons why I like to read about the kings is to not just look at what they did well, but to look at what they did wrong. Hello, somebody. I, I, I am a critical thinker. I, I, can't, I can't help it. And, and it works sometimes against me, but for the most part, it works for me. I like to look at things. I want to get it right. Anybody want to get it right? I want to get it right. So, so I'm a study of leaders and I'm a study of leadership. And I think that one of the things as it relates to leadership that is fascinating to me is when you begin to look at the leadership styles, the contrasting leadership styles between the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. And, uh, and, and as you know, Paul primarily was sent to the Gentiles, and Peter primarily was more inclined towards the Jews. And, and it's interesting because neither of them started there. Paul started in orthodoxy. You remember that? Paul, if you study, what is that? The, uh, Philippians chapter 3, read your whole Bible. You'll find it, but he, but he talks about how he's a Pharisee from the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day, all these things. So he was very much orthodox. But then when you see his, him moving, his ministry was more to, to the Gentiles or, or the worldly, so to speak. And then Peter, there's, there's really no history of Peter before Jesus touched him. We know that he was Jewish, but, but I don't suspect with the way that he moved that he was an ultra-religious fella, cutting off ears and, and cussing and various things of that nature. I, I just suspect that Peter might have had a little hood in him, if you know what I'm saying. And, and yet we see when it's time for them to do ministry, it's almost like they switched, where Peter becomes more orthodox. I mean, remember Peter? Peter was the one saying, no, 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 no. Them Gentiles need to get circumcised now. He, he becomes religious. <laughs> and, and Peter becomes more free. Peter starts talking about, to, you know, to, to the lawless, I became as lawless. Isn't that interesting? And I always wondered by that. I, I'm a curious type of dude. And I, and I thought to myself, you know, God, God why would you allow them to, to experience things uh, kind of outside of their upbringing, etc.? cetera? And, and I really feel like one of the reasons why God may have done it is so that they can grow in grace. Because we typically only have grace for what we are familiar with, right? Even when we look in today's spiritual or kingdom or church landscape, those who are called to the church, those whose primary calling is to edify the church, those who, who, are, who are already saved, oftentimes don't have a lot of grace for people or ministers who are called to the world. Hello, somebody. They, they judge each other and accuse each other, and you're too soft and you're too light and all that kind of stuff, but there are different graces in this thing. Hello, somebody. And, and, and according to our calling, God bestows grace upon us according to our unique callings. I, I was called when I first started ministry, I was called to build a church in Hollywood. 
Hello, somebody? To build a kingdom church in Hollywood. So I had a unique grace to reach people who were unchurched, which meant that I had a different language. I had a different look. I had a whole different thing. Hello, somebody? Even though I was saved in the Baptist church, right? So a lot of times, those who are primarily called to the church have a difficult time. They don't have a lot of grace for, for, for those who are called to the world. And then it works the other way, too. Sometimes those who are called to the world don't have any grace for the church. Are you tracking with me? And what maturity does is maturity causes us to recognize the fact that we all are a part of one body, one family with a unique set of gifts and talents and skills and graces. Watch this until we all come to the unity of the faith. And so in this text, I just, we were just talking. And so in this text, Peter in particular is talking to the church. He's talking to the church. Those who were already in the faith. They were already there. They were already in the faith. And the, this passage, it's one of my favorite passages of scripture because it is very layered. Hallelujah. And it has levels, just like our faith. Our, our faith is, is layered and it has levels. That's, that's why Paul said that I have not arrived. I have not already attained, but, but this one thing I do, I forget what's behind me, and I continue to reach forward to those things that are ahead of me because there's more. Do me a favor. Turn to somebody and say, there's more. There, there, there's more. There's more. And so Peter starts this very layered and leveled text passage off by talking about what we currently have. He starts it off reminding us of what we currently have. So verse one, it says that those who have obtained, those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God, our savior, Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and there are five things that he talks about at this foundational level of our faith that I'm just going to run through quickly because we got some ground to cover. Of course, he talks about salvation. He talks about how we have obtained righteousness of God, right? The righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And salvation is absolutely incredible. We talked about it before the service. We talked, or before the, the, the moment, the moment that we just had, we talked about how incredible salvation is. If God didn't do anything else, salvation would be enough. Like, for real. I remember when I first got saved, man, I was so happy. I wasn't happy because God was getting ready to bless me. I wasn't happy be because God was going to make me a multi. I, I wasn't happy. I was just happy because I was saved. I, I was happy to know I had a place in the kingdom. I was happy to know that God wasn't going to deal with me according to my iniquities. I was just happy that God saved me. Anybody just happy? Because God saved you, that you've got a place in God, that when you leave this place, you don't have to worry because to be absent from the body is, is to be present with the Lord. And whew, the psalmist said, said, you will guide me with your eye and afterwards receive me into glory. I don't know about you, but, I, but I'm happy about that. I don't walk around with the fear of death because I'm in covenant with God. I gave my life to God through Jesus Christ and come what may, everything is going to be okay. I remember when I was 16 years old and I got shot in a drive-by and I remember... I'm on the, it was all, before it was all said and done, I'm on the, on the ground and I'm coughing up blood. And you know, when you see the movies, you, you know what it means when you, when you're coughing up blood. And, and I called on the Lord and, and I prayed and, and I, and, and I woke up and I was in the emergency room and my mama was there and my mama had this serious look and she was praying. And I looked at my mama and I smiled to her and I said, mama, I'm sorry for being stupid. Amen. Let's just clear the air. I'm sorry for being stupid. I said, but don't worry. If I die, I'm going to heaven. 
and I meant it. It was an anchor to my soul. Foundation, salvation is a wonderful thing. Watch this. And I don't care how blessed you get, it will never not be wonderful. Oh, hallelujah. I don't care how big the God dream is for your life is, salvation will never not be amazing. Oh, his grace will always be spectacular. His grace will always be something you ought to lift him up for. You ought to thank him every day for salvation. And yet, it is just the foundation. It is just the foundation. As Peter is walking through these, these things that, that we have, he talks about salvation. And these are the things that I see when I, when I read that text in the first four verses. Can I take my time and teach today? I see salvation. I see spiritual growth, right? When he talks about he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus. That's really powerful. Because when we grow, spiritual growth ultimately is growing in the knowledge of Jesus. Because in him, the fullness of God dwells. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. True spiritual growth is not in you growing, growing in your knowledge of the scripture. It's not about how many passages you can quote. Hey. The enemy can quote. Hello. Spiritual growth is not how proficient you are in speaking in tongues. Hello, somebody. If they have tongues of angels, they probably have tongues of demons. Can we just have a conversation here? Spiritual growth is not about that. Spiritual growth has to do with you and I growing in the knowledge or that word in the Greek, literally the recognition of Jesus. That's how we are. So I see in that text, I see salvation, I see spiritual growth, I see hope. I'm talking about things that are in the foundation of our faith. I see hope. Where's hope? I see hope where it says giving exceeding great and precious promises. Oh, hallelujah. When you get saved, God gives you promises. Why? Because he wants to activate your hope. Because a hopeful person is an empowered person. Oh, I feel that right there. A hopeful person is a faith-filled person. A hopeful person is someone who the devil cannot shake. You might come, come what may, but I still have hope. You might throw a curveball in my plan, but I still have hope. And we have exceeding great and precious promises. And I love that because, get this, you never are without an exceeding great and precious promise, which means that you ought to never be without a praise. Oh, hallelujah. If I am alive, goodness is still in my court. That's why the Bible says I would have fainted unless I believed to see the goodness in the land of the living. That is hope. And this is not cheap hope. Oh, I feel God. This is not cheap hope. The Bible says this hope make it not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. In other words, the one who gave us hope is in us, Christ in us. The hope of glory as my bride so eloquently prophesied last week. This is not fake hope. This is not cheap hope. This is not just think positive and name it and claim it. No, no, no. This is real hope. This is hope that won't disappoint. This is hope that's going to speak and show up in your life if you don't cast away your confidence. Are you tracking with me? Somebody needs to get hope stirred back up in their life. I hear God saying, whatever you throw away, never throw away your hope. I feel the Lord. Can I take a pit stop just for a second? The Bible says, cast not therefore away your confidence. That's your hope. That's your expectation. It says, wherein there is great reward. There's reward in your hope. You're not hoping aimlessly. You're not expecting aimlessly. There's a reward 
at the end of your hope. Get your hope back. Get your hope back. Get your hope back. Get your hope back. Tell your circumstance, give me my hope back. Give me my hope back. In fact, don't even tell them. Take your hope back. Take it back. Take it back. Take it back. You can't have my hope. You can't have my joy, but you can't, you especially can't have my hope. Here's what that pastor says. I got to move on because we got a lot of ground to cover. <sighs> Hebrews 10.35 Cast not therefore away your confidence wherein there is great reward. Watch this. It says you just have need of patience that after you have done the will of God you shall inherit the promise. I don't know whose word that's for. I don't know whose word that is. I hear God saying, don't cast away your hope. Watch this. You can only cast something away that you have. Don't sacrifice your hope. I feel God. I don't know who this is for. Don't sacrifice your hope. No, there's something connected to it. That's why the enemy wants to hit you and punch you and make you begin to question God and doubt God because he knows that all you got to do is not be weary in your well-doing. All you got to do is hold on to hope. And if you hold on to hope in the process of time, in due season, you're going to reap if you don't give up. Do me a favor. Open your mouth and shout, I've got hope. I've got hope. I've got hope. And as glorious as hope is, it is yet still the foundation. The foundation. When I see those first four verses, I see salvation. I see spiritual growth. I see hope. I see transformation. What do you see? Transformation, PT. Because it says that I'm going to make you partakers of the divine nature of, 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 oh, I feel the Lord, of the divine nature. I, I'm getting ready to evolve your very nature. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm thinking about Dr. Jill. I'm thinking about Enoch in the Bible. And there is not a whole lot written in the Bible about Enoch, not a whole lot. There, there are really two primary things we know about Enoch. One is, he walked with God. And two is, and he was not. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And then later on in Hebrews, it says that he didn't see death. So we understand what that not is. But, but, but hold on, look at that for a second. The Bible said, it says, he walked with God. And then he was not. Then I'm thinking about Amos 3.3. Can two walk together except they are agreed? So, so, and it wasn't because we know many people walked with God, right? He wasn't the only one. But, but he must have walked with God in such an unusual way. In, in such a succinct way that he, watch this, morphed into... The one he was walking with. Oh, I wish somebody would catch what I just said. God is looking for some people that will walk with God so succinctly that they will allow God to order their steps and they will follow that instruction so perfectly that you will walk right into the presence of God. I wish about a hundred people would understand what I'm talking about. You know why he didn't die? Because he was dying to himself with each step. Every time he stepped in obedience to God, he was stepping outside of his old nature and in to his new nature. Come on, somebody. I feel transformation is getting ready to take place in this house. I'm tired of walking according.
yielding to the course of this world. I'm getting ready to walk with God. If that's your word, holla at me real quick. I'm about to walk different. I'm about to move different. I'm about to talk different. I'm about to socialize different. I'm about to do something different. I want that Enoch blessing. I want that Enoch anointing. Uh huh. That's what I'm after. The Bible says you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, but rather you will fulfill the purpose of God on your life. Transformation is a part of this thing. And as amazing as transformation is, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As amazing as transformation is, is still just the foundation. Are we still talking? Are we tracking together? So, I see all this. When I look at this text, I see salvation. I see, I see spiritual growth. I see, I see hope. I, I see transformation. Five, I see deliverance. Hey, she have a... Uh, it says, having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust. That's, that's the bondage that pulls, uh, have, having escaped. So, so, so in my, my foundation, in what God gave me, I escape some things. I, I've been delivered from some things and, and, and there is an anointing to be delivered. There, there, there's an anointing to have generational curses broken off of my life. There, there's an anointing to have demonic oppression subdued and broken off of my life. Oh, it is incredible. No weapon formed against me can, can prosper. Every tongue that rises against me is, is condemned. Ooh, God. Luke 10. Behold, I give you power to tread upon, tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by no means shall hurt you. That all comes with your faith. And it is absolutely glorious. And yet, and yet, even deliverance is just the foundation. It's, isn't that crazy? I, I, I was addicted for years. Someone's testimony. I was addicted for years. And when I got saved, Jesus broke it. And, 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 and. And, and my life changed. I'm talking for all of us. And my life changed. I went from darkness to light. And yet, and yet, that was just a foundation. There are levels to this. We go from strength to strength and glory to glory. Salvation, spiritual growth, hope, transformation, deliverance, and yet, and yet, according to the text, this is just the beginning. See, when we hear these things, I see some people's whole life. Hey, I feel God. It, 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 it's taken my whole life to check those boxes off. Which means that you could have lived your whole life or the better part of your life and yet still it's just the beginning. Oh, 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 oh. Anybody want to go all the way with God? I, I don't know about you but, but I, I want to go 
all the way with God. And the reason why I know that this is just a foundation is because from here in the text, Peter switches gears. He sw that was just Peter's introduction. He switches gears and begins to level up the conversation by going beyond just faith. Can we talk about it? See, family, we have got to mature so that we understand, watch this, that faith is not the ultimate goal. Hey, faith is not the ultimate goal. We're about to I'm gonna show you in the text. Healing, as magnificent and as wonderful as it is, ain't the goal. Because you're gonna get sick again, and all of us are gonna transition. So why would the goal be temporary? Deliverance. As magnificent as deliverance is, is not the goal. So then the question is, well, PT, doggone it. What is the goal? I am glad you asked. The goal is to build. Oh, let's unpack it. The goal is to build. So, in verse 5 of the text, I told you I wasn't going to preach today, I'm just going to teach. 5 says, in verse 5 it says, thank you. 5 says, but also, watch this, for this very reason. What are you talking about? Faith. Since you've got faith, here's Shabbat. And in your faith, you've got salvation. You've got spiritual growth. You, you've got hope. You've got transformation. You've got deliverance. Now that you've got that, you've got all that in your faith. For this reason, he says, I need you to add to that. <laughs> God, it took me all I had to get to it. Yeah, that's wonderful. And truth of the matter was, that was actually all me. But I didn't save you just for you to be saved. Because if that were the case, when I saved you, I would have called you up. I didn't clean you up for nothing. I didn't spare your life for nothing. I didn't bring you out of this and bring you out of that for nothing. I didn't send my mercy and my grace for nothing. Now that you are saved, now that you are clothed and in your right mind, now that you are free, I need you to build. 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 I've called you to be a builder. I've called you to add to your faith. That word add is a very peculiar word in the Greek. That word add, when he says, I need you to add to your faith. I'm glad you got it, but I want more. Not more for salvation. You're good there. But I want more for your life because I'm doing something in this world that you were sucking up air in. And I'm not going to do in this world what I'm going to do in this world without you. You are my instrument. You are my agent. We are the body of Christ. We are the hands and the feet and the mouth and the eyes and the heart. And what I'm going to do in the earth, I cannot do without you. Oh, I saved you because I love you. But I did all that other stuff. I freed you so that you can be a liberator too. Can we go further? Can we go, can we go further? That, that word add in the Greek is an interesting word. It's the Greek word epikorigeo. It's from two words. Epi, which means, watch this, to
to superimpose or to place or lay over above something. That's to build. Epi. And then the other word, corrigeo. And that literally means, it's very interesting, the, the picture there is a choreographer or a choir leader or someone who, watch this, who is designing and supplying and furnishing something of an expression. Let me say that better. Let me say that better. Let me say that better. So you put those two words together and we're talking about a band leader or almost like, watch this, almost like a general contractor. Okay? The general contractor has a vision. And he furnishes all of the supply and everything that is needed to build that thing. Are you tracking with me? That's why I'm talking about build. That's why I'm saying that Peter switches from faith and just that foundation to you now building something on top of that foundation. So what God wants us to do, and we're going to go deeper, God wants us to build something on top of our faith that will be a praise in the earth. Interesting, the, the, there's language in there in that word that, that speaks almost to the arts like a dance leader or a choir, and not dance leader as just one who dances, he's the lead in dance. No, the one who choreographs. Or the choir director, not just one who's in the choir, but the one who puts all the parts and pieces together to create an expression. To create an expression. So what God wants you to build on top of your faith is something that creates his expression, that shows forth his praises in the earth. I, uh, I'm gonna get a little transparent and a little personal with you. I, I, uh, if, if, I think that if I were back in the, the days where, with the tribes, you know, all the tribes were doing their thing, I think that I would be of the tribe of Issachar. The tribe of Issachar. And what we know about the tribe of Issachar is that Scripture says that they understood, they had knowledge of times and seasons and what Israel ought to do. And I'm not so convinced that I would be a part of that tribe necessarily because of, of any sort of predisposition or gifting or anything like that. It would be more so because of my hunger to get it right. I, I think maybe, I, I think maybe when, when, when you have come near death, I, I think that when, when, you, when you have come close to death I think you get to a place where where life is not a joke where life 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 is not a game and 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 and, and you come to a place where you, you don't want to just be living watch this you want to live accurately you you want to live precisely you you want to live with precision and so so I've been seeking I, I, I don't just just get up and do I, I've been thinking and I've been seeking and I've been praying and I've been praying to God about this season can I talk to some mature believers for a second here this morning I've been praying about the season because notice the sons of Issachar, the tribes of Issachar, it says they understood times and seasons. But not only that, it says, and what Israel ought to do. That second part is just as important as the first part. It's one thing to understand the season that you're in. It's another thing to know what to do in that season. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. So I want to, yes, know what time it is, but two, what do I do According to the time, because Solomon taught us there's a time and a season for everything under heaven. And then he talks about the doing. It's a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. So according to the season, there is a behavior. There's a behavior connected to the season. There's an emphasis connected to the season. There's a focus connected to the season. And so as I begin to seek God about the season... God started speaking to me about Noah. 
about Noah. Y'all remember Noah, right? And he started talking to me and speaking to me and saying, if you want to understand the season that we're in and you want to know what you need to be doing, think about Noah. I said, oh, Lord. Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 24 and 37 and 39. He says, but as the days of Noah were. Mind you, the context of this is when Jesus is talking about the last days and all the things that would happen in the last days. Wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in various places, nation, ethnos, rising against ethnos, nation, and the love of many growing cold, signs in the heavens, and I don't know about you, but all you got to do is look around and you see much of that happening. In that whole passage, it's not all bad news because it says, and also in that time, and the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached to all nations. So the rhythm of Matthew 24, watch this, has to do with things happening with greater, watch this, frequency and intensity. That's the rhythm of that text. And so if the rhythm of the text has to do with things happening in greater frequency and intensity, then that same rhythm applies to the gospel of the kingdom being preached to all nations, right? So this is a wonderful time for the church because with greater fervency and intensity, with greater frequency and intensity, this gospel of the kingdom is getting ready to take off. Somebody ought to be excited about that. But in the context of that passage, in Jesus explaining about what's going to happen, giving them, watch this, an understanding of times and seasons. He talks about Noah. This is the heart of the message. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days, watch this, before the flood, look at this picture, they were eating and drinking, marrying, and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, watch this, and did not know, did not perceive until the flood came and took them away. Okay, 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 okay. This right there, there, there are certain passages of scripture that get my attention. Because in essence, watch this, in essence, what Jesus is saying is that there are going to be people doing life and business as usual, watch this, when they should be building for the flood. I feel the Holy Ghost of God right about now. I'm trying to help about a thousand people this morning. When I see God in this season, God is telling me it is time to build, baby. It is time to stormproof your life. It is time to build something so that when the rains come and the winds blow and the floods come and beat upon your house, it will stand. It is scary. I got to take my time and unpack this thing. It is a scary thought to think that we could be on the precipice, on the cusp, at the door of a flood and be desensitized to it. Because watch this, we are distracted by business as usual. <laughs> yeah. As a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there are two things that I hate. Ignorance and unpreparedness. I'm like Paul. I would have that you not be ignorant. Because ignorance is not bliss. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I'm looking at this. 
I'm looking at this. This is what I mean by a stormproof life. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this thought down. The journey of the believer is not to build a life, but to build an ark. Yeah, 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 yeah. The journey of the believer is not to build a life, it's to build an ark. I want to be honest with you sometimes. This is going to sound real strange. So I was born in the 70s. And I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I wish I was born in the 50s or the 60s. Sometimes. Sometimes. You're like, you have to break that down, Pastor, because I'm not tracking with you. Some, sometimes I wish I was born in the 50s. Because in the 50s and the 60s, you had to be sober. See, we, we prospered. By the time I, I came, you know, we, we had overcome a couple things. We were starting to prosper a little bit. It was the, you know, love revolution. That's kind of how I got here, you know. It was love revolution and, you know, this free expression, you know, and all that. And all that, that's wonderful. That's cute. And that's wonderful and everything. But, but, the, but the people who were born in the 50s, and the 60s, watch this, they didn't have the option of not being purpose-oriented. Ooh, I, I respect you so much. I, I know my kids are like, no, I, I, no, 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 I, I, because, because I, 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 I've come to understand that although prosperity is a blessing, prosperity is dangerous. Because with prosperity, you get further and further away from the attitude that got you prosperous. In the 50s and the 60s, you needed faith just to walk down the street. You had to become somebody. It took character. To grow up in the 50s. And sometimes, I'm not even going to lie, I, sometimes I just wish, you know, now I'll take what I got, that's fine. I wish I could have, watch this, the character of those who stood tall in the 50s and the 60s and the prosperity of the now. The journey of the believer is not to build a life. Don't let nobody sell you that. Is to build an ark. Now, the beautiful thing about the ark is that you can put your life in the ark. Yeah. Can, I, can I keep talking to you? See, this is what I mean by a storm-proof life. Let, let, let's talk more about this ark. I want to break this down a little bit. If you're taking notes, write this, this thought down too. Building an ark is about a mentality based on a message that creates a mission. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a mentality based on a message, a word that creates a mission. It's how you live your life. Let me give you something else to write down. Your ark, watch this. What is your ark? Your ark is your covering, it's your security, it's your protection, it's your stability. It's ability for yourself, your family, your community, and all that are assigned to your expression, your expression, your expression. All of us in Christ have an expression, a unique expression. The people that are assigned to my voice are assigned to my expression. And keep going. Building your ark is building the kingdom. <laughs> because all of these things, see so your life and everything you want is in it. That's why the scripture says in Matthew 6, 33, what does it say? You know what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all other things shall be added. I was in Israel in 2011 and I... I was there for just a few days, four or five days, and I remember my, my driver, his name was Ellie, Ellie, and he was a very kind man, and he was a very loving man. 
But there was something in his eye, and I, and I was trying to figure it out. There was, he had a, it was a sobriety in his eye. He was kind. He was living his life. But there was something there. And then as I went about and I went to restaurants and I went to the old city and I came across people of all ages, they were smiling, they were happy, they were cool, but there was something in their eyes. It was as if they were living with this duality. They were in the moment that they were in, working and doing business, but they had a consciousness that at any point and at any time, some sort of rocket or some sort of terrorist situation could happen at any moment. If you go to the schools in Israel or any place where there is lots of war, but in Israel in particular, you'll see kids on the playground and they're having a good time. But if a particular siren goes off and they hear that siren, they will shift in a heartbeat from playing to going right to where that bomb shelter is. They live with a duality. They are not disconnected from the life that they're in. They are going to school. They are working. They are loving their families. They are having fun. But they're functioning with a consciousness that at any given moment, something could happen. And if it happens, I'm going to be ready. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about coming to a place, I feel the Lord, in your life. Well, yes, you are excited about your fiance. Uh-huh. Yes, you are excited about the deal that you're trying to close. Yes, you're excited about sending your child to college. Yes, you're excited about all these things. Yes, you're excited, but you got an ark parked around back. You got your bags packed and you are ready at any given moment. Come hell or high water, if this thing starts shaking, I am standing on a sure foundation. If you know what I'm talking about, give God a shout in this house. Come on, somebody. This is Get Ready 2.0. Come on, somebody. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Come on, stay ready, 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 stay ready. Stay ready. Stay ready. The signs are there. The signs are there. Can I take my time and teach this thing? The signs are there. Get ready. We used to say it, get right church. Come on, somebody. We used to say it in the old church, get right church. Pastor, when I pray and ask God what's next, and let me tell you something. I've got exciting things going on. Exciting things in business going on. Life-changing things in business going on. I just married off my daughter in April. Incredible things taking place, conferences taking place, major things taking place, a lot to be excited about. And if I wasn't spiritual or sensitive, a lot of things to be distracted about. But every time I close my eye and pray, every time I ask God what I should be focusing on, every time I ask God what season are we in, he says it's like the day of Noah. Build your ark and do not spare not. Do not spare not. Do not delay. Oh God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I don't care how you look. I know Noah looked crazy. They're partying and turning up. Noah, come on, meet us down at the spot. Noah got a hammer in his hand saying, no, 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 y'all go on. I got a message, and that message is creating a mentality and a mandate. I am on a mission. I'm about to build something because when this thing hits, I'm going to be all right. 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 
I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this to activate you. We got an ark to build, baby. Your life is waiting on this ark. Your family is waiting on this ark. Your community is waiting on this ark. The world is waiting on this ark. Let's get to building. I know what I'm talking about. God should not be worrying about closing this multi-million dollar deal compared <laughs> to what I have in store for you. <laughs> that ain't nothing. Yes, keep on building. Yeah, go ahead and get that money. Yeah, go ahead and do what you got to do. But don't you stop building that out. That's like those who were on the wall. You remember that? They kept on building with one hand. But they had that sword come out, somebody, in the other hand. I'm talking about duality. I want you to be happy. I want you to be excited. I want you to be optimistic. But I want you more than any of that to be ready. To be ready. To be ready. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Building your ark. It's building the kingdom. It's building the kingdom. And yes, the church is just one way to build the kingdom. I'm building the, I'm building the kingdom through business. I'm building the kingdom through technology and science right now. Hey. I, I, I say that. I say that because I don't want you to be stuck trying to figure out how to build. Some of you all you need to do is just change your focus in the, in the industry or the place that you're in. Feel God. Watch this. Anywhere where you have influence, you can build the kingdom. God has given you influence so that he can influence the kingdom through your life. Are you tracking with me? Not everybody's going to build it like this. I feel that. See, it says, seek the kingdom. You got to seek the kingdom that's twofold seek it in that you pray discern but then seek it in that seek it seek to proliferate it are we tracking can i talk to some kingdom people i'm not talking to church folk i'm talking to kingdom folk church folk won't get this kingdom people will surely get this hmm The ark is building the kingdom. You're building something that can't be shaken. That's what I'm trying to get you to do. You, you can be in the same job without this mentality and your work be shaken. Oof. See, I need to take my time and pull back. Hebrews says that, that God said that he's going to shake is Hebrews 26, study when you get a chance. Hebrews 12, rather, in 26. He says, he says, I'm going to shake. I, I shook the earth once, but, but next I'm going to shake both the heaven and the earth. And then I'm going to paraphrase. He says, everything that can be shaken will be shaken so that that which cannot be shaken can remain. And he tells us what cannot be shaken, and that is the kingdom. Now, the kingdom is not a place. Hey. The kingdom is not even necessarily a job. The kingdom, watch this, is an empowered agenda. It's God's empowered agenda. It is the reign and the rule of God. And his agenda to extend that reign and that rule in the earth through you and I. Now, if you use your influence in your business, in church, wherever, in your community, on your job, whatever. If you take that understanding and you use your influence to, to perpetuate the agenda, the kingdom agenda of God, that is you building your ark. Oh, I feel the Lord. 
God is so serious about his kingdom and consequently his kingdom representatives that if you get about kingdom in your company, God might spare the whole company because of you. You don't believe me? Ask Lot. We got to keep going. We got to keep going. I'm almost done. We got to keep going. And so, and so, you might say, PT, man, that's like, that's really extreme. It's like very spiritual and it's very eschatological. And I'm not really thinking like that, God. I, I just, I got a broken heart. I need you to help me get my, through my broken heart. Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm having trouble in my, in my marriage. God. Oh, that's wonderful. Now you don't know, you don't know. But that ain't really kingdom. That's counseling. Can we have a real conversation here today? You say, Pastor, that's been bit much. You know, I'm, I ain't coming for that. Be, you know, and, uh, and I want a bishop anyway. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but God wanted you to have this. Hello. He wanted you to have this. You, you might be thinking, man, this is a lot, man. You know, a lot. But, but let me just make it more practical for, these, for those of you who are more pragmatic. Watch this. Even if history alone repeated itself, even if history alone repeats itself, the world is going to experience radical shifts and changes sometimes suddenly. We can despiritualize it right there. For which we would need to be prepared. Everybody's ark is different. Everybody has their own specific ark. And the shape and the design will be different according to God's plan and the pattern for their lives. It'll be different. Watch this. But the material the essence and the substance of the ark is the same. And that brings us back to our text. It brings us back to the place where we left off in the text. It brings us back to where Peter is saying, add to or build upon your foundation of faith. Let's go, let's go, let's go. So these are the things that we must build in us on top of our faith that will give us, watch this, the ability to build our ark. If you're taking notes, write this thought down. You cannot build what you are not. In other words, let me say it the way I put it in my notes. I cannot build beyond what I am. Hey. I can't, so, so, so in order to build a good ark, I got to build a good me. Hello. And so in the text, he gives us seven things. I'm going to run through them quickly, like seven things. That's seven hours. Maybe. I had you at about five, fifteen, five, you know, just in time for dinner. No, I'm just kidding. Three, three thirty. Okay. He gives us seven things to add on top of our faith so that we can build ourselves and consequently build the ark. The first thing he says, he says, add to your faith virtue. And that word virtue has to do with really character, to be a person of valor, a person who has high standards. My wife talked about character last week, has character. Watch this. And, and, and every and every form of excellence. I, what I've learned about excellence is excellence is excellence. Excellence is not excellence in one thing ooh, and mediocre in another thing. E either you are excellent or you are not. Excellence is not excellence when someone is watching. Excellence is who you are. Excellence is a characteristic of God. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how excellent is your name. Watch this. Excellence 
is an evangelistic tool. People will see your excellence. People will see that you are of, a, are of an excellent spirit and will inquire about that spirit that makes you excellent. So I'm not just going to have faith. I'm going to be virtuous. Oh, God, I feel it. I'm going to be excellent. Put that on top, right? So these are my materials. I'm building an ark. I'm going to be excellent. If I am an employee, I'm going to be excellent. If I am a boss, I'm going to be excellent. If I'm an investor, I'm going to be excellent. I'm going to have character. My yes is going to be yes, and my no is going to be no. Let me tell you something. There's an incredible book. If you haven't read this book, it's by Stephen Covey. It's an older book, but it's called The Speed of Trust. It's a powerful book, and the premise of the book is if people trust you, it will literally save you time and money. Hear me. There are billion-dollar deals done on a handshake where if it's a $1 billion deal, typically there will be $100 million worth of due diligence just to make sure, just to cover all bases. But there are some, watch this, billion-dollar deals that are done with a handshake. Watch this, because of the integrity, the history of excellence and integrity and character with the parties involved. Saves time because you don't have to spend all that time in due diligence and it saves money because you don't have to spend millions in due diligence. And now, watch this, that means that being of good character is more profitable than not. Are we tracking? So he says, add to your faith, build on top of your faith, virtue, and then build on top of that virtue, knowledge. Knowledge. I'm thinking, study to show thyself approved unto God. We know that, right? But I'm not quite sure that all he meant was the scripture when he said that. Yes, study the scripture. It's a wonderful thing to do. Study. I study scripture every day. But I also study, watch this, things like science. And watch this, whatever I need to study according to the call that is on my life. God's not going to supernaturally endow me with something I can pick up a book and learn. Hey. All I need is the Holy Ghost. Yeah, and a book. <laughs> and a teacher. And a mentor. And maybe a degree. He's saying right there, in order to build what God wants you to build, you're going to have to be excellent. And you're going to need some knowledge. Are you tracking? Let's run through these. Virtue, knowledge. Number three, self-control. Hey. I, I like the, the idea of self-mastery. I can't master life until I master me. Paul talks about bringing his body under subjection. There's one word that was translated self-control. It literally means inner dominion. I can't have outer dominion until I have inner dominion. Now, I cannot master me if I don't know me. Hey, oh, I feel like teaching and preaching. I wish I had about 19 more hours with you. I can't master me if I don't know me. And the trouble is, I don't mind knowing the me that I understand. I struggle with acquainting myself with the me that I don't know or the me that I'm afraid of. Oh, I'm about to preach and teach in about 30 seconds. There are some rooms in my life that I am afraid to go in. It's like having a house and you live in all the rooms, but there is a room in the back and the light is on in that room, but that door is locked 
and you hear noise coming from that room, growls and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And every once in a while, something bumps up against that door in that room, but you walk right by it because you're like, I am not ready to deal with whatever is in that room. But what I have learned is that if you don't learn to deal with what is in that room, what is in that room is going to deal with you. Oh, can I talk to some real people right now? And the truth of the matter is, it's already dealing with you. If you are afraid of it, there's a consciousness of that room, which means that you are not even fully present within yourself. I wish I had about 18 people that would catch what I just said. As long as I'm afraid of walking in that door, I am in bondage. I feel like teaching and preaching and helping about 30 people. There's a passage of scripture in Proverbs, and I believe it's Proverbs 14 and 4, and, and, and if that's not it, just read your whole Bible. I promise it's there. It says, where there are no oxen, the crib is clean. The crib being stable, oxen being bull. So let's put it together. Where there is no bull, the trough, the stable is clean. It's neat, it's organized, everyone knows where it is. There's no trouble, nice and peaceful. It says, but much increase comes from the strength of the bull. That is profound brilliance. What he's saying is, see, a lot of times what we do is we know how to organize our mess. Hey, I'm gonna walk like this. We, we know how to organize our junk. Come on, you, it's the same way sometimes in our house. We know how to sweep things under the rug. We, you know, you, you got somebody coming over for a date and you start putting stuff in a room and they get ready to go in the room. Don't, don't, don't you go in there. It looks good, but it's not good. So, so where there is no bull, you ain't got to worry. Everything's clean, right? It says, but the increase that your life needs. And we're talking about building, building, building. The increase that you need comes from the strength of the ox. In other words, if you put that ox in there, yes, it's gonna get messy. See, that's what people are afraid of. They're afraid of things getting messy, but how many of us know it has got to get messy in order for it to be miraculous? I feel God. And some of you are at a poor shit. You're at a point in your life where it is going to have to get messy. You have swept it under the rug long enough, baby. But the time is, oh God, I feel the Lord. It is calling for you to stop being afraid of the mess. Because if God gets you in it, he can get you out of it. He's leading you in that room. He's leading you in that room. God wouldn't call you to a room that he wouldn't keep you in. Mm, I cannot wait until we get ready to pray in a few minutes. I cannot wait. Something's going to break in this place. You're going to leave out of here. Oh, I feel God. We got to run through these. We got to run through these. And so, and so, so we're adding to our faith virtue. We're adding knowledge. We're adding self-control. We're going to master ourselves even if we have to go into rooms that we're afraid of because I cannot master what I do not recognize. Endurance, add on, to, on top of that. Perseverance, endurance. I love that a Greek word. is the Greek word hypomony. It literally means to stay in a given place while under something. Hallelujah. In other words, to develop the discipline to not quit when it gets tough. To develop the discipline, come on somebody, where you learn how to live in a tough place. I feel that. But not to run when things get difficult. That is a quality that you have to develop. I feel that thing. I love the way the Navy SEALs train. They don't train for good times. They train so that they can function when things get difficult. And I believe that the Holy Ghost wants you to be like a Navy SEAL. He doesn't want you to be a fair weather believer. He doesn't want you to be a fair weather person. He wants you to have endurance. He wants you to have hypermony, the ability to still function while you are under something. 
We're adding. These are the building materials. If you're tracking with me, say, I'm still tracking. I'm still tracking. I'm still tracking. Virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, which is endurance, godliness. Godliness is holiness. And holiness is one of the mis most misunderstood words in the kingdom. Because most people think that holiness is behavior. Hey. Holiness does not mean behavior. That's why it doesn't say do holy. Hey. The Bible don't say do holy. It says be holy. So holy is not a doing, it is a being. And it is a being that can only take place if you were transformed. So the path, I, a, I got a whole book on it called Holiness. But whole, holiness ultimately is to be spiritually whole. And when you are spiritually whole, that's when your behavior changes. So if you seek holiness through behavior modification, you will miss it. Because even if you change your behavior, you can still be unholy and do what looks like holy things. I ain't got time to teach it. But holiness has a lot to do with worship. Wish I had time to teach that thing. Has a lot to do with worship. When you worship, you open up to God and extend, watch this, his wholeness until you're into your brokenness. Oh, <laughs> Woo. Yeah, that's what happens. And watch this. As we're worshiping God and we invite him in, we bring that. See, you, we won't even know what to give him if, unless we go into that room. So I bring all of my brokenness and I lay it down at the altar and say, here am I. I don't go to him like the Pharisees saying, I do this right. I do this right. Here I am. You're righteous. Say, no, 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 no. I am a broken sinner. And if you don't make me whole, I cannot be made whole. And I worship you and I adore you. And as I worship God, I begin to be, watch this, transformed. Come on, Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 3 and 18. I, I become transformed into that image through worship. That's a whole nother teaching. I want to run through this. So, so what we got? We got virtue, which is excellence. We got we got, we got, oh, I'm pulling my nose. We got, we got knowledge. There we go. Thank you. We got self-control. We got perseverance. We got godliness, which is holiness. We got brotherly kindness. Now, this one I want to spend a couple of minutes on because this, this brotherly kindness, if you study it in its original language, it means fraternal affection. And the reason why this is important is in order for you to build what God is calling you, calling you to build, you're going to need other people to help you. And if you're going to need other people to help you, you're going to need people's skills. Hello, somebody. You're going to need people's skills. You're, you're going to need to learn how to be in relationship with people. And people, all of us, can be a bit complicated. There is a such thing as people's skills. And the last thing you want to do is to allow a bad attitude to sabotage a kingdom relationship. Hey, are we tracking? A bad attitude. To sabotage a kingdom relationship. So we're going to need brotherly kindness. That's fraternal affection. And lastly, we're going to need love. At the end of the day, we're going to need love that is agape. This is that rich love. Watch this. That type of love that's hard to offend. It should be hard to offend you. And I think that one of the reasons why we can oftentimes be easy to offend is because we have not been made mature in the reality of God's love toward us. See, God will love you so wonderfully that what other people do to you will roll right off your sleeves because you are so drunk and baptized in the love of God. You are so affirmed by that love. Your future is so solidified by that love. You are so established in that love that you walk and you literally, you emit love everywhere you go. So when someone throws hate on you, you're like, oh, baby, you love me. You just don't know it yet. It just rolls right off 
for your back because ain't nobody got time to be offended move from the mark I am on a mission there's a call on my life I've got an art to build I've got a world to change and I can't be worrying about how you feel about me if you are loved holler at me I'm loved I'm too loved to be mad at you. I'm too blessed to be angry with you. I'm too blessed to be holding a grudge. I got too much destiny on my life to be mad at you. I'm not worrying about what you said. Worried about you? I love you. You're just crazy. You need a little bit of love. In fact, you know what? Here's some love, baby. Maybe that will solve your problem. I've got love to burn, baby. Come on, somebody. I've got love to burn. Here, hater, take some love. Here, enemy, take some love. Here, jealous person, take some love. I've got love to burn, baby. It's raining love over here. Rain in love. What you need, baby? You need some love? Got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. you. Take that. Take that. Take that. Because I need all this to build my ark. Because strong vessels produce strong vessels. Oh, God. Now, we're almost done. The rest of the text reveals some very, prom some very powerful promises that if we would be disciplined, consistent, and purpose-oriented and are committed to be builders on this level, we're going to realize these promises. Let's look at them real quick. So verse 8 says, For if these things are yours... <laughs> are yours, not something that you visit, not something that you rent. Come on, somebody. Sometimes we got to rent self-control. No, buy it. Own it. I don't have self-control just sometimes. I'm after it all the time. I'm bringing my body on this subject. No, no, if these things are yours, I like that, are yours, you're claiming them. I feel this for somebody. Stop defining yourself outside of what the fruit of the Spirit is. I need to say that better. Stop, stop calling yourself something different from what God calls you. Yeah, I got it. I, that's just how I am. But that's not how God is. And we were created in God's image and His life. Don't tolerate that. I feel the Lord. I feel the Lord. Stop saying about yourself what God is not saying about you. So it says, if these things are yours and they abound, it says, you will neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's powerful. That's powerful. You will neither you will never be barren or unfruitful. Watch this. In the knowledge. That particular word is not the same word that was the knowledge that you add on. That word was actually gnosis, knowledge, true knowledge, studying things. This one is the word, is the Greek word, and it means recognition, which is tied into what he said in verse 3. Remember when he said that God has given to us all things has already given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge that word is recognition of Jesus so here the promise is if these things that you've built on as you're building your ark you're building it you so that you can build your ark if these things are in you and abound you will never be barren nor unfruitful watch this in your recognition your knowledge of the Lord watch this which is the place where God has given to you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Did you catch what I just said? In other words, what I'm saying is everything that your life and your future needs 
is already done in Christ and you and I are able to make a withdrawal on those things according to our recognition of Christ. I feel God. So he says, if these things, if you build yourself, you will never be unfruitful when it comes to recognizing, seeing, or perceiving what God has for you. And once you see it, you can pull it down. Oh, hallelujah. Are we tracking? That makes sense. And then he says, look at these promises. And then he says, but in verse 9, he says, but to the contrary, and this is the opposite of the person, this is the opposite of an ark mentality. He says, for he who lacks these things, watch this, is short-sighted. Short-sighted, confined to only what they see here and now. Ooh, 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 that's scary. If, if my life, the whole of my life, was only limited to what I can see right in front of me, ooh, what a scary existence. In fact, the Bible calls it blindness. It says, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness. I don't want to be that person. You know, I ride motorcycles. And if you go to motorcycle school, they teach you not to look at what's in front of you, but to look way down the road. For one, you on a motorcycle, uh, things in the road are less forgiving on a motorcycle than if you were on four wheels. But they teach you to look through what's right in front of you and look way down the road and anticipate the turns or it could cost you your life. Being short-sighted could cost you your life too. It, it is the opposite. It is the opposite of an arc mentality. An arc mentality says, yeah, I'm in the here and now. But I have prepared for what is inevitably coming. Are we tracking? But he doesn't leave us there. I'm landing. We're not left there. Look at this final promise from the text. It says, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. You will never fall. I feel the Lord. Even when the flood comes, even when the storm comes, even when the wind blows, come what may, if you have built your ark, you will never stumble. It says, for so, and this is mind blowing. For so an entrance will be supplied. That's an interesting word. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When it says an entrance shall be supplied to you abundantly, what is interesting is that word supplied is the same word that was used when God told you to build. In the text, it's the same word. Epigor, epicori gale. It's the same word. What, which means that what you didn't know while you were building for God is that God was building for you. <laughs> and he wasn't just building for you, but the Bible says he was building for you abundantly. And then he's also giving you access into the riches of his everlasting kingdom, which is the abundant supply of everything that you will ever need to build your ark for yourself and for everything assigned to you. And so I'm closing this moment out with the question that requires examination. 
And here is the question. Can you live in what you are currently building when the storm comes? You think about your life and what you're building right now. I'm not saying that what you're building is not positive. That's all wonderful. But this is a moment of examination. Can you live in what you're building? When, when the shaking comes, and it will come, God said, once more I shake not only heaven, but heaven and earth. That's kind of powerful because, you know, I, I get him shaking in earth. What, what do you mean shaking heaven? There are principalities and powers. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, right? And so some of the things that are taking place in the earth are being conducted and choreographed by principalities and powers in heavenly places. And so when God says, I'm not only going to shake the earth, but shake heaven, he says, I'm going to shake those principalities and powers. Oh God, I feel it. Oh, the verdict is in. God wins. Every system, every system, every structure, everything that God did not build is coming down. But watch this, not just in the heavens, but in the earth, which brings me back to my question. Can what you're building right now, relationship, business, marriage, whatever it is, can it withstand the storm when it comes? Or will you have to leave that building and try to find shelter at the last minute? Are you going to be eating and drinking and giving in marriage and getting married and doing all the things that, that unenlightened people do? and have to go and try to find somebody's ark? Or are you gonna build your own? In order to build for the storm, some of you, I'm gonna be honest, are gonna to have to deconstruct some things. Some of our lives right now are comprised of systems that you created, that you've built your life on, and the systems that you've built your life on promote stagnation and dysfunction and mediocrity but you've gotten okay with it because you found a way to work around it and make it work not realizing that that there's loss when that takes place some of you you know under the sound of my voice are going to have to switch out the foundation in real time in real time it's going to be hard. It's going to require strategy. You're going to have to strategically and surgically shift the foundation in real time because it's not all bad. It's not all, but you're going to have to, it's going to require, I'm going to pray to that end. But the good news is, the beauty of God is that even if you haven't built right, it's never too late to build. It's never too late to build.